So my guest today is Sofia Quintero. Sofia is the CEO and co-founder of Enjoy HQ, a company in the customer research space that was recently acquired by UserZoom. Prior to co-founding Enjoy HQ, Sofia was head of growth at Gecko Board, a data visualization platform. And prior to Gecko Board, she had many ventures and hustles from selling flowers made of toilet paper to selling skateboards. Uh, Sofia's journey into entrepreneurship is fascinating. So we'll dig into this. Sofia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. Great. Uh, so maybe we could start at the beginning. So, so could you maybe walk us through your early path into entrepreneurship and working technology? Wow. Okay. Entrepreneurship. <laughs> Let's start there, perhaps. So yeah. I was born in Venezuela a um, um, long time ago, <laughs> long, long time ago. And um, while I was living there, um, my parents, my parents uh, are both economists and they work uh, most of their life in, in corporate. So they work for Ford Motors and other organizations. So I grew up with this idea that that's what you kind of needed to do, that you needed to go to university, get a degree, and then somehow get an amazing corporate career. And as I, as I grew up and I started discovering, you know, who I was and, and what I was interested in and, and the things that I wanted to do, I recognized that very quickly at early age that the only way to do that was to generate in some sort of money that I couldn't wait until I finished university and get my corporate job to actually do the things and buy the things that I wanted to get. So I think every single kid goes through that process of realizing, oh my God, I need actually money to buy the things that I want and I need to produce it in some way. I cannot wait 15 years okay. to get there. And so I started coming up, I don't know, naturally came up a lot of, I come up with a lot of ideas when I was leader at school to, to make all sorts of like, tiny amount of money. So I, I remember very clearly um, buying candies and lollipops and so on uh, in a shop nearby my house and then bringing those um, uh, to the school. So I, I had to hide all that stuff because of course that's not allowed in a school, but I will hide it and I will sell it during the recess, during the break. Um, and and I, don't, I don't even remember if I actually was making money, bro, I was losing money, but I was just so excited <laughs> that I could bring something and somebody else will give me some money for it. Okay. And so that was the, the kind of the, one of the first kind of experiments that I did. And it was just literally because I wanted to buy my own things. I wanted to have this power that all these adults had that I didn't know, you know, how to create a magic uh, as a child. And then going to the toilet paper flowers. That sounds awful. Now that I think about it, like oh, I, it's I, don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know how I sold them. But basically um, in Venezuela, um, I have a couple of uh, family members in the United States where I'm living now. Uh, they live in Texas. And I went to visit them when I was 12, my uncle. And I don't know, I found myself excited about being in the United States. It was like really cool and very new. But at the same time, I got really bored very quickly because we were not going out all the time. We were at home. And so I, I don't remember why, but I remember being bored and, and thinking about that kind of experiment that I did at school and thinking, well, maybe I can do something to make some money because certainly there's a lot of things that I could buy here in the United States. Yeah. And so I, I remember that I did some craft type of uh, kind of classes before. And I don't know, I started building, yeah, some talk toilet paper, white toilet paper, and I roll it and I turn it into roses. And I went and I sold that door by door in the neighborhood where my okay. uncle was. I think people, it was just like sad for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, those flowers, you know, I was selling those flowers, but um, I was selling them for one cent. I mean, okay. and so I got, you know, a little bit of money there at the time, yeah. that's a long time ago, but um, but the, the interesting thing, the takeaway from me from doing those things when I was a child is that I learned to not be scared to talk to people. That was the first thing, like to do something and not be scared about what other people might say or, or think about what you're doing. So that was very important because later in life, as I grew up and I went to university and, and, and I started my career, Along the way, I did many other experiments, very tiny, a lot of things didn't work, a lot of things uh, work a little bit, but I kept doing things. And, and partly 
um, building that skateboard shop. Like I, I, I actually didn't build it. My boyfriend at the time had a skateboard shop and I remember I was working as a consultant. That, um, that's my early twenties, my first job as a consultant. Okay. And, and I made a ton of money as a consultant. It was an amazing project at the time. And I was lucky to get involved with that company and I made good money from it. And I invested it all in that shop and I literally quit and I started working on the shop and just like skating a lot and, yeah, and just yeah, being, such, yeah. The, yeah, being involved in the skateboarding industry, which also taught me a huge amount of things. If I have to think about entrepreneurship, I have to think about skateboarding always. Like, is this fundamentals a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So just like, first of all, skating and also how the skateboarding industry works, or at least okay. worked at the time and how it has evolved. But generally speaking, skateboarding as a, as a sport or as a lifestyle has a lot of components on entrepreneurship. So I don't know, I did a ton of experiments. I had a magazine in Panama. I lived in Panama for six months. Okay. I, had, okay. I have a... This thing was crazy. I sold, not, not even sold, I published, um, um, no audio book, what's it called? An ebook. Yeah, when I was like 19 years old and I had to buy an e commerce platform that was super expensive at the time. I had to borrow the money just to sell an ebook. That, that okay. was the case. Like you couldn't put an ebook online at the yeah. time. I'm talking about yeah. like, you know, early 2000s, maybe like the late 90s. Okay. So I experimented with internet, I experimented with businesses and different types of things throughout the years. I don't know where it came from, but I really think now that I look back, it was just this powerless feeling that I had yeah. when I was a child. That I just want to buy my own things and I just yeah. reacted that way. Because you had a very early start into some aspects of entrepreneurship in that case, because like, you're mentioning the candies would have been before you were 12. So like yeah. you, you've had these realization like very early where you were like, okay, like I kind of want to fix my problem that I don't have money or that I need to have some, some way to buy what I want. So I'll get into trying these experiments to see what actually works for me. Mm, you know, so now that you mention it, I, I probably, probably a big element or influence there is that my parents were really good at trying to put me in, in the right schools and, and good universities and so on. But we were like middle class, maybe maybe not even middle class. And they put me always in universities and schools where there were a lot of rich people, a lot of people that had a lot of money. So all my friends will have a ton of things that I wouldn't. Okay. Uh, and so I think that probably drew, drove a lot of that kind of need of, you know, I want to have the same things. I want to have the cool you know, clothing and the, the toys and so on. So that might have been a, a reason yeah. because when I look back at university, that was even more pronounced. And, and I remember very well feeling like an outsider because I didn't have enough money. So maybe maybe that was the case. I have no idea. Psychology okay. works that way. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting how people evolve. So your, your start with the ebook uh, and maybe the skateboarding shop, the consulting was kind of your start in technology at a, in a broader sense. Yeah. But then you ended up moving to the UK. Yeah. And and actually had a path that led you to working at Gecko Board. Can you maybe yeah. talk about that, uh, that transition a little bit? That was a big jump. So moving to the UK, um, mostly was driven by the fact that Venezuela was collapsing um, as, a, as a country, as a nation. Uh, we mm -hmm. go into the dictatorship and, and life was becoming really, really hard and, and really insecure as well. In, in Venezuela. So I knew that I wanted to travel the world and I knew I wanted to do something outside Venezuela, but the situation that was evolving there really pushed me forward. I just really needed to do it. And so I, I remember wanting to move to the UK just for a year because at the time I didn't speak English. We you just learn the basic English at school, but it wasn't my second language. So I, I moved in 2006 to the US, to, to sorry, to the UK to, learn English. That was the first point. Okay, was it wasn't even to leave Venezuela. I wanted to leave Venezuela, but I wasn't sure if England was going to be the place and if I could do it. That was so scary just to move to a completely new country and, and just start from scratch. So I did that. I moved in 2006. And uh, because I didn't have like good English, and maybe I still don't, but definitely it was worse yeah. then. I basically um, had to start like working out all sorts of jobs. I was working at Subway, the sandwich shop. Uh, I was working, uh, this is a fun story, in a street club, but not as a stripper. I was just a receptionist. <laughs> I was a receptionist, charging people to get in. 
um, in a very small town in, in England called Bournemouth. Okay. Uh, okay. It's in the south and it has like, it's a beach. It's also just for students and so on. So I did also jobs. I was trying to learn English. I went to school to learn English there. So it was really tough for me to be coming from having like a good job in Venezuela and having all these kind of career and projects and things that I have done and just really, really start from scratch in the UK. I couldn't just jump from what I knew into some sort of cool job because I have this limitation of not knowing English and also being very insecure about moving to a completely new country. And I needed to bring back my confidence. So I spent a lot of time getting back to, to something similar to a career, learning English. I did a master's degree in, in London uh, after a while. In a different Mass language. Communication. Yeah. But, in yeah, a language so, you had just learned. <laughs> which it was literally a good reason, right, to do it because I felt For sure, like- sure, but it's I, very impressive. <laughs> yeah, thank you. If you can do a master and a dissertation in English, I feel like if I can do that, I can totally go and work for, for a company. I can work normally, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we will hope so, right? So I, I did that and then I was just desperate to to build my skills and my understanding on the industry in, in, in England and understand my way. So I started um I had my first opportunities in big digital advertising agencies. I like, it was basically internet, but just focus on advertising. So okay. I, I found that that was going to be a creative endeavor. And then I, I like it. It was a good opportunity to get started in the UK, but uh, I quickly realized that you cannot be as creative as you think you can be in an agency environment. And so um, I started to focus more on the digital marketing side of things and trying to understand where could I learn more about building software companies, uh, growing software companies or digital products in general. So that was around 2008 or nine that I started really to focus on developing a stronger career on that area. And so I learned a lot by myself. I didn't have a ton of money. So I basically like wrote, uh, read a ton of books and online courses and so on. And, and the experience that I have selling my own little projects and trying my own little yeah. things help a ton there. So I was very lucky that after working for a couple of agencies, I, I managed to land this job at Gecko War. And, okay. and that was amazing because I was the first marketing hire uh, there. It was a tiny, tiny big company it was, I don't know, six, seven people maybe uh, uh, when we started. And I had the opportunity to bring all these things that I wanted to do in one place. I, I was able to, to really build the foundations of what growth and marketing will look like there. And it was, uh, I'm always grateful to Paul, the founder, uh, Gecko Borg, because he, he just was excellent, an excellent boss, an excellent leader. And so that helped me to learn a ton on, on the job and, and also do projects on the side as well. I still did all the random projects on the side that helped me to kind of put in practice those things. Sometimes you get a job and those jobs, you want to do a lot of things and others you cannot do because they don't apply to that particular job, but you still yeah, want to experiment yeah. with those things, with technology, with other kind of channels and so on. So I will use these kind of personal experiments to, to try to see, okay, well, what that looks like if we did, you know, some sort of weird ad in this new platform, stuff like that. So that helped get a board grew. Um, uh, we, we had a ton of success for a while and after being working there for, for three, four years, I think, um, I was starting to feel in that I needed to, to do my own thing again, but full time. Now with all these experiences that I had and all these failures, I felt like, okay, cool. Maybe, maybe now that I know a little bit more, I, I thought that I knew <laughs> more, yeah. uh, we can, we, I can do something interesting here. And, and, and I look very closely to the pain points that I had when I was working. What were the things that made my life difficult when I was trying to grow Gecko Boring, implement all these growth strategies? And so part of the discovery and thinking uh, is, is where Enjoy HQ at the time, Nom Nom, came from. It came from this... Uh, constant frustration around not being able to access the data that I needed to have access to in order to make decisions around how to position our products, how to what to build as well next, like how to think about customer experience in general. So it was this need of, can we have a bit more visibility into what we are gathering from customers, whether it was, you know, support tickets, social media, interviews, okay. whatever it was, I wanted to have more access and it was very difficult 
because of the systems that we were using, because there was not a lot of user research experience in the company, a lot of different factors, but I felt like there was a way to solve it from a technology point of view. There was a way to at least alleviate the pain in a substantial way. So that's like a very compressed background of how <laughs> I got there, but, uh, but that's how oh. I started thinking about my company, yeah. Great, so that's a good, uh, a good launching point from there. So what, the, the original vision there was to use what, what types of data specifically? Like what yeah. was your original idea specifically like and at, at that point? Yeah, at that point, it was more of a, an aggregator. I just wanted okay. to have this kind of mini Google in the company where I could just search something, uh, you know, put the keyword analytics and see all the feedback and all the stuff that we have researched in the past about analytics in the company because we had a component of, you know, dashboards and so on. So I just wanted to to be able to tap into the things that customer support teams were exposed to, the things that uh, product managers were exposed to through interviews without having to ask them, without having to get a license to one of their tools, without, um, yeah, without having to necessarily go into the hoops of understanding, you know, can you give me that data? Can you just export the CSV? Like those micro interactions feel like very tiny, but people tend to stop themselves for asking what they need just because you have to do a ton of things to get it done. And so things like literally asking other people to stop what they're doing to give you some sort of export. And so I wanted to eliminate that friction and just be independent, have my data and being able to, to do my own analysis, especially qualitative analysis, because okay. quant is different. It's, the, it's, it's, it's literally it was more developed we were very a data-driven company at the time, but very focused on the numbers. But the qualitative side of things, that was the tricky part. Okay, so it was all over the place. Different teams had information that was interesting yeah. to you and other people in the company, but was not accessible. Correct. So what convinced you at that point when you started thinking, hey, maybe there's an opportunity there? Like what convinced you that this actually adds substance there? That there was something that was, it was more than just you that had these... Uh, the, the, these these problems or that was facing challenges there like what convinced you that this might be a business i think there are two things there one uh almost like a personal uh situation if you like and another one that is more of a professional opportunity so the personal situation was that i was reaching the point uh, at gecko board where i felt i had done a lot of things but i wanted to have this other next level type of experience and and i was feeling a bit of a on a, this crossroad, I wanted to define, okay, what I'm going to do next? Do I really want to like go and get another job in another place? Or do I want to try the things that I like to do, which is just a starting thing from scratch and see if I can be a little bit better this time. So I was going through that process of making that decision, understanding what is the next thing that I want to do that is going to make me really happy. Uh, and then the other side of things is that while I was working at Gecko Board, I also had the opportunity to build some sort of profile in the UK, in the industry by speaking at conferences and so on. Okay. And that helped me meet a lot of people. And within that, I met um, a VC, a micro VC in Portugal, uh, and they invited me to talk at uh, one of their conferences to talk to their portfolio companies, just to tell them how I, how we grew Gecko Board. Okay. And, and I did. And and what I when I understood, that was the first time that I, I met a VC, actually, and the first time that I understood what they do, kind of. Okay. And I just, I was thinking about this problem of data access and so on. And so I just wrote an email and, and after the event and I sent it to him. Not to ask for money, not for nothing, really. I just wanted somebody, the investing companies, to tell me what they thought about the, 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 this idea. And I just wrote my rationale, like the market, what I think. No idea about pitching and so on. But he thought that my background and the idea was good enough to give it a shot. And so he said, if you're ready and if you think that you want to do this, you know, I can give you like this tiny amount of money so you can quit. Uh, and because I was also... I had a micro founder already uh, convinced somebody to do this already. <laughs> and even though I didn't know if I was going to do it, it was just mostly like, okay, if I have to build something, I need to, I need to find somebody to help me out. But, but then when I sent that email. A solution at that point or like, was there a no, solution something you built? Or? No, we didn't build anything. It was okay. just literally just a concept in terms of an idea that I described, okay. but I was just talking about this with one of the engineers at Gecko Board that ended up being my co-founder. So when I, 
presented this email to, to this partner, this VC. Um, yeah, he felt it was compelling enough. So it was easier for me then to feel, okay, I have the drive and the motivation. I'm, I'm, I'm in the right moment now where I need to decide what to do next. And I have, I wouldn't say validation, but I have this moment of confidence where somebody else that is looking at a lot of companies might think that it might be worth at least to give me some money to get started. Okay. So that's when I told Lukash, my co-founder, like, look, we have this chance. You want to jump? You want to actually go <laughs> for it? And we did. And it was just yeah. like, one of those, I felt alive again. That's the, that's actually the description. When I okay. when we did this and we got the support of a VC saying, uh, "I'm going to give you a little bit of money to getting started." I remember this feeling. I was walking in Soho in in London, and with my co-founder, and just being in this state of, I don't know. Ecstasy, so I will imagine, I don't know, this extra happiness where I was like, oh my God, I feel alive again. Like I'm back to who I am. It was very strange because I always felt like that with my little projects, but this time it felt like more real. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I knew at that moment that, that definitely that's what I wanted to do there and also for the rest of my life. Like that, okay. I, I understood that this is the type of person that I am. It took me quite a while, but it was good. Yeah, yeah, we're all on journeys to discover ourselves, but as well what we do and all that. But so that's interesting. So like you had a moment of clarity, you said, like where yeah. at that moment you were like, okay. So I, I, from what I understand, you also discovered about yourself, but you, you discovered about the opportunity and there was, there was this nice fit there. Um, yeah, I think it's like, uh, perhaps just to add there is the fact that I didn't, I didn't know a lot about entrepreneurship. I didn't know who I was a founder. I didn't, I didn't really understand that on a personal level. I knew there were companies and the founder of Gecko Board and I was just trying to grow the company. That was the concept that I had. I, I always thought about my experiments as projects, never mm -hmm. as companies. And so when I came up with this idea of Enjoy HQ and, and I have my co-founder there at the time, it's literally a friend that was helping me to continue kind of understand this this space when i talk to this we see what really happened there is an understanding that there is a type of people and they're called entrepreneurs and they can go and pursue things that are big that that understanding that it sounds very basic i i didn't internalize it until somebody told me go i believe in you let me give you some money go and build this thing and build it big until that moment i hadn't internalized that I could be that person. Before I thought of myself as a growth professional, as a you know a person interested in, in marketing and in, in internet, as a person that is proactive doing different projects and creative. But I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur, a person that starts companies as yeah. a career. So that was my moment. But that's, that's really interesting because we could easily argue that what you were doing in Venezuela was entrepreneurship, right? So like yeah. at that point you hadn't put the label on it or you hadn't yeah. seen it like that or you hadn't. Uh, I think I added a label, but that helped me also uh, feel more confidence and understand, okay, I know weird because when you're doing a lot of projects on your own, yeah. you are the weird person. So think about <laughs> yeah. it. I'm, I'm a woman, 21 years old, jo left my job, which was paying me very well to start or join a skateboarding shop. And yeah. I'm skating in, in Venezuela with a bunch of people and then like selling boards and selling clothing in this shop. That is perceived, at least in Venezuela, it was perceived as a very risky thing to do as a as an huh. liar, as yeah, a yeah. like, you know, are you throwing away your education yeah. and everything else and your job for this weird thing that you're never gonna make money? So for me, all these things that I tried before were more of me being at the weirdo instead of being entrepreneur. But then once I got the label and I knew what entrepreneur, yeah. what entrepreneur was, I was like, okay, yeah. that's much better. That doesn't sound like a weirdo. It sounds like actually cool. So yeah. that was my, my conceptualization of that. So it was kind of your entry in that tribe that was kind of started yeah. when you met that VC and it was like, hey, there's other people like you. There's exactly. other people that have ideas like you that want to pursue these things and do these, th these things. Yeah. Uh, can we mention the amount that you got from that funding? I, I, I know it, but like. Uh -huh. uh, oh, so uh, tiny. Well, I mean, it was huge for me at the time, but it's tiny. It, that, that tells you how much I didn't know about business, but uh, it was 40,000 euros. Okay. And, and so the question there is, how did you structure things? So you have a co-founder, you don't have a product, you mm -hmm. have an idea. 
you have 40,000 euros in London, which is one of yeah. the most expensive cities in the world. Correct. Uh, how do you set yourself up for so that either there's more money at some point in the future or you have a product that actually has sales or whatever? Like, how did you set up that initial timeline so that you would be successful as a, as a company? Oh my God, if I could go back. Um, <laughs> the, the truth is that I didn't know any of those things. What I knew was that I understood the problem because it, I was experiencing it that issue that I saw it before because that was not the first time that I experienced in Gecko Board. I experienced it in my other jobs when I was consult doing consultancy for customer experience, when I'm doing marketing, all the other jobs that I had in my life, I always had that problem one way or another. So I knew the problem. I knew that uh, it could be solved because I could imagine very tangibly what was the solution in my head, what would be helpful. I knew that I had a partner that wanted to do this with me. And that was huge because I'm, I'm not an engineer. And once I got that commitment of somebody saying, I'm going to give you this money to make it happen, I knew I was going to make it happen. I didn't sit down as I will do today if I start a new company to create a roadmap of how I'm going to distribute this or how I'm going to build the product and, and sell it. I just didn't know. I just focused on learning, researching, looking, meeting people, meeting my, my, my ex-boss that is a, a founder, a successful founder. Like I just was desperate for learning. And when you are very... Uh, ignorant and naive the cool thing about that is that you learn very fast mm -hmm. and, and you feel like everything is new which that's how it should be anyway but um I, I just start experimenting with everything that I learn. When people say, oh, you need a roadmap. Oh, shit. I, what is a roadmap? Okay, let's, <laughs> let's do a figure roadmap. It out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, well, we need to grow this part. Well, growth, it was easy because I knew about growth and I knew that once I had a product, you know, I knew some of the basic things to do to take it off. But the most important thing was the product at the time. Like, how can we solve this problem that is very complicated in a way that is elegant and in a way that other people can actually use and mm. see the value? The product was my biggest concern at the time um and so that was my focus but literally i managed to raise more money because the same vc that gave me the opportunity literally said to me at some point you're going to run out of money so maybe you want to start you know join accelerator or you're going to have to race around and i okay. didn't know what a racing around was i kind of <laughs> knew what a, yeah. yeah and so i went okay what is racing around and what is an accelerator okay let me do that that's the thing it was as basic as that i would like to yeah. tell you that I yeah, knew yeah. a lot of things and I was involved in the industry and I was super strategic, but the truth is like, I don't know anything and therefore I'm going to have to research and meet people and get shit done. That was it. But, but do you think that that, uh, I don't know if naivete is kind of like the right word, but like that kind of like not knowing these things is actually maybe a positive thing to some extent. It is positive stage? for the first company. You okay. always want to have to go through that process. And I think it is positive because you don't know how hard it's going to be. So you keep mm -hmm. going um, and, and you don't know how the journey is going to affect you and what are the things that are going to be successful or not. So not knowing is a blessing. But once you get to something that it starts working and then it's a detriment because you really have to implement things that have been done before, uh, systems and processes that help you scale. So I think that was very good at the, in the first few years of the company, getting the, to a point where we could we innovate in the space and we had something solid that people were using. But later on, I felt like, okay, now I need the experience. Like I cannot carry, carry on necessarily like- Yeah, you know, just make it up all the time, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was very passionate about the problem space. I understood the problem, the product, passionate about all that area, but then like not necessarily very good at understanding scaling and processes. So that was a different stage. And therefore in that part of the journey, you definitely want to rely on people that have done it before and have a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. Now, the, if I think about my next company, let's say, um, I wouldn't like to have that naivete or, or at all. Yeah. I think it's just, there's nothing better than having this experience and being able to make different mistakes. But I think it's important to, yeah, to be curious and not to feel bad that you don't know a lot of things at the very beginning. So that's good. So um, what convinced the early customers of Enjoy HQ to sign on? So you, had, uh, you were working on a new product or you were in the process of working on it. Uh, what convinced the first few customers to, to say like, okay, I'm in. 
I think what it was awesome for us is that as we were building like the beta program and trying to open it up, I realized, first of all, I didn't expect that so many people were going to be interested. I remember we have a couple of thousands of, of registrations for the beta program. So that was yep. like a good sign of, okay, we're doing something good here. People are interested. Okay. And then as they sign up for the beta program and we just gave them access to this really bad product at the time, <laughs> uh, what I learned by talking to them was how painful this was actually was. Um, it was not necessarily a, a, a pain that they might like to solve someday or something that was just bothering them, but they could live with. I really understood, okay, people are really not liking the situation and they want to solve it or they're already solving this problem, but they don't like what they build internally. That was the time where I understood, okay, this is a big problem. And the only reason that I think people sign up for Enjoy HQ and I'm not at the time, it was because the pain, it was so heavy in their operations. So it was so difficult for them to manage and do the research and understand the data that they were willing to try anything to solve it. And that's a massive, that's when I understood the, the kind of the, the lesson of, you know, build a painkiller, not a vitamin. I happened to be lucky to build a painkiller. That was just luck. A lot of people told me there was a vitamin at the beginning. A lot of mm -hmm. initial investors and people that didn't want to invest and other people kind that of didn't have the pain. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But then once you meet the people that are really suffering from the problem, you realize, okay, this is actually very important and they're willing to solve it with a product that is not even finished. Okay. So that gave me a ton of motivation. I have mm -hmm. to say the first users that we had really gave me the conviction. I didn't know if I was gonna be a huge company, but I gave me the conviction to, to carry on, to carry on. But how did they express that that pain or that frustration with what with, with they had? Oh, the common thing that I remember, I, I will clip the videos when I interview them and I talk to, the, you know, to them and I will clip the parts where I will describe the pain because they will say things like, Oh my God, I've been dreaming with this for so long. This is amazing. I, or, oh, I really wanted to build this myself. Uh, or my previous company tried to build something like this and it was awful. I, man, I want to see this life. Like there was always this sort of like, oh, it's great that finally somebody's doing this. And it maybe is not the, the most precise kind of type of language to for you to infer that oh yeah definitely we have something that people need you, I wouldn't necessarily say that you need to hear those things to confirm and validate it but at least at the time it made me feel okay this has been in people's heads mm -hmm. it has to occupy their thoughts during work enough for them to take the time to jump and verify what is that I'm offering and to try to understand a bit better and give me time so that was a little bit of a another sign that I was going in the right direction. Other yeah. people will actually describe it like, oh my God, it's a pain that I have to talk to this team to get this report and it doesn't work because I don't get the raw data, I just getting their interpretation. And then how do I know that they know how to do research? So I will get all these complaints that were very similar to the things that I will say myself as well when I was back in Ecobor and in other places. So that was another sign. It's just little things like that that help you move forward. Because okay. then you have to validate it at a bigger scale, right? But at the time yeah. I just needed to get the first 10 customers, the first 100 customers, right? So that was enough for me to carry on on the process of developing or redefining the solution. And, and how did you guys drive those initial signups? Because you, you interviewed these people that were mm -hmm. signing up, but how did you drive them? How did they initially discover the value proposition or the pitch? This is the nice thing about investing in your network early, even if you don't know what you're going to do with that network. So by working in all these other different companies, by, my, by doing my little projects, by uh, trying to meet people to learn from them when I started building the company, by learning about growth in companies and hustle. Um, basically, initially, I contacted a lot of people, you know, by email, like, hey, I'm doing this, and therefore, can you try it? In a very, like, a silly way, because I wasn't even asking if they had that problem. I just wanted people to try the product. But then they will, of course, they will introduce me to other people. Or okay. I will go directly on LinkedIn and ask, like, product managers or growth people, like, hey, I'm doing this. So it was just like a one-on-one-on-one-on-one -on -one -on -one conversation. So it was just okay. trying to through my network, get to places 
um, where people will pay attention. And it helps when you build a little bit of a reputation because and then they know, well, I'm not a crazy person that wants to talk to them. I'm mm -hmm. somebody that had a job before and now is doing something else. Okay. So I think it was that, just the hustle, one person at a time. So do you think it's, it's, it's partly because you had a fairly focused network as well? Did that help in that sense? Or? It, it could be, perhaps. I don't know. Like, I knew a lot of people at the time. Most of my network was uh, growth people, product managers. You know, that was when growth hacking was a yeah, thing. A bigger and thing, so, yeah. Yeah, so you had a lot of product managers trying, you know, doing some sort of growth uh, or getting into growth. And then you have a lot of marketeers there. So a lot of the initial people that I talked to or they sign up for the product were either growth people, product managers, marketeers, uh, some designers as well. And that, yeah, that was the initial network that I had. Okay. So, so initially you guys were doing customer interviews with the people that are signing mm -hmm. up to learn and improve the product. How did the, uh, how does the cust company in the customer research field evolve its uh, customer research practice as it goes along? Like throughout the years, how did you guys evolve how you learn from customers? It hasn't, until now, it hasn't changed much because okay. when, I, when I think about user research, you have, uh, or customer research, you have different methods, you have different ways to, to go about it. However, for me, building relationship with customers is, is what really drive those deep insights. And, and all of that sounds like a jargon, but let me explain a little bit. What I mean by that is if you, if you sign up for my product the first time when I had this crappy version and you get to see that I care about my product, that I really want to solve the problem and you are having that problem, there is a very obvious kind of win-win situation, right? And so that's fine. What often happens is that, and I'm being on the other side, what often happens is that once I talk to you and I got what I needed as a founder, I forget about you. Unless you pay me, I just literally don't talk to you again, probably. That happens all the time. I'm always interviewed for some sort of new product and I never hear about these people before or, la or later. But what I kept doing is I will talk to you again and then I will talk to you again and ask you, oh, sorry, I'm not going to bother you, but you have like a five minutes because I just have this question. I have this thing. So I try to build these often or constant interactions with all the people that I was talking to for the first time. So instead of thinking of one off kind of interactions for the purpose of customer research, I thought about them as building this network of customers, okay. even though they hadn't paid me first, you know, so yeah. get them at that point. And so that brings some sort of problems as well later, because you don't know if they're paying you because of you or you're paying you because of the yeah, product. Yeah. But then you learn that later that people are not that friendly. Even if they like you, they will still not pay money for your Everyone, product. You don't yeah. like it. So, but in generally speaking, I never thought about user or customer research as a one-off thing or, or a transactional thing. I always thought about it as an ongoing process. And so we did a lot of usability testing and surveys and all these things that everybody does in different methods, but I really focus uh, on, on building those relationships. So what I noticed though, is that after you have talked to a team, for example, 10, 12 times over two years, in very deep conversations, they start telling you things that they will normally not tell you okay. and uh, use a research. It, they start telling you things that have a context. So they will say, oh, you remember last year when I told you that I needed to do this feature, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't need that anymore because this thing happened in my company. And so now what I need really is this other type of feature. And so you start understanding the request of a new feature in the context of how the user evolves through their journey and the app and how they solve the problem. That, kind of um, historical context around how people use your product is so rich. So a lot of the innovation, a lot of the new things that we build that competitors copy later were features that came from that type of conversations where okay. people really told me how they have evolved their thinking of their own problem and the usage of the tool through the years because of how things change in the company. So it gave mm. me this big understanding of how okay. my tool, my product sits within the ecosystem of things that a person does in the company and also how it sits throughout time. Okay. 
So it's not like I'm solving this problem for yeah. this person this year. It's like this customer changes, right? The, the things happen in the company, the company grows, they buy other tools. So that constant understanding of that evolution is what drive ideas and different innovation that you don't get by doing a usability testing or doing one customer interview here and then. So that was the secret sauce that I'm planning to use forever, which is mm. do is continuous customer discovery, but yeah. it's more than that. It's, it's building meaningful relationship with the people that you're doing research with. And can I ask like how many people are we talking about? Or how many companies are like are you in contact with with over like these years? Like how many oh thousands. Are, You're, you're speaking, are you yourself speaking with all these companies or? Yeah, I was doing like until now. <laughs> until that that amazing. I was, yeah, I was doing demos and conversations, customer support. I would join the conversations. Okay. I, have got, I have got shop calls with customers, like literally like a friend. I yeah. will go, hey, we haven't talked in like four months. Let's talk about things. And we start talking about work okay. and the product, but you end up talking about other things. And then that brings you back to additional context. So you build a relationship a little bit better. So I, I just build all these relationships and I kept doing it. That gave me a lot of headaches because of course I, I, I didn't have enough time to step back. There was a lot of noise coming in. There's a lot of things that come from it, but even the downside of being the founder and doing all of that by myself, it's still, it's not enough. I still will do it again the same way. I think the gains from that practice are, are way bigger than whatever sense of overwhelm or, or time management or issues that I had at the past. Yeah, like yeah. I I will do it again. So now, of course, I needed to scale it. So now, you know, when our choir, we're scaling other people. I hire other people to do partly that job as well. Uh, product managers and marketeers and so on to do that research. But I never stop. I never stop until this day. I still talk to customers. But as you're scaling, are you trying to get your team to kind of follow that blueprint that you established? Where, you, where do they best. are doing, okay. They're doing yeah, that research best. over time. Correct. I do my best to share those, those, um, there are principles, right? It's just about, mm -hmm. and again, maybe they lead, this, this will lead us to, to psychology and neuroscience and so on. But <laughs> it, it is about understanding human psychology, right? Like a, how, how people share information and how you can build relationships to really understand the context of everybody's situation and, and understand the problem from different angles, not just mm -hmm. your angle, you know, not just your product and how people use that product within their context. There's so many things going on around humans and within organizations. So I try to share the value of that with everybody in the company now and, and anybody I use or some as well. I try to share like the importance of it. There's always friction, right? Because if people don't understand, Initially, they feel like that's like unnecessary work. Like, oh, but I'm already talking to customers. Why I need to talk to them again? Those type of things, that type of friction will always exist. But I think it's just important to keep pushing and talking mm -hmm. and convincing and helping people understand that you are dealing with humans. You're not dealing with users or customers. You're dealing with humans. They have life. They have context. They have problems. They have emotions that make irrational decisions. And therefore, you have to spend the time to understand all of that. And that means many, many, many calls. So <laughs> that's that's how I think about it. No, it's amazing. Uh, okay, so that you mentioned that that ties in into the neuroscience. So you've been you actually you're actually studying neuroscience now. So like, how, mm -hmm. how does that tie in into that journey, both as a person and as a as a CEO of a company or CEO of a company that was acquired by a company, another company? Yeah, um, well, I have so many reasons for studying neuroscience now, um, all sorts of reasons. I think, and I can mention some of them, one that comes to mind immediately is not only our need to understand customers much better as humans, but the huge responsibility that we have as founders and, and creators with society. Like I really got fed up with like what has been happening in the last 10 years with the big companies, with like the whole manipulation, misinformation, using the dark patterns, like everything that we have experienced, especially in the last two years with Facebook and so on. Uh, I grew up very tired of being part of an industry uh, where we have these type of problems. And, and we think that it's just these big companies behaving this way. We are all involved in this mm -hmm. problem. We are all building companies and we are also repeating different patterns based on the incentive that we have. So if you have, if you're a VC-backed company 
uh, you might have very good intentions, but you do have a different incentive. You have the incentive of growing really, really large. And therefore your product team and your, your user research team and your marketing team will think about growth in a very different way. And that will influence the type of features that you build. And you might not consider what those features might do to people when it comes to behavior and their well-being. So I think one big part is that I think every founder should have a deeper understanding of the human brain and how the human psychology works. So when we build products, we build things that don't make humans build unhealthy habits yeah. or manipulation or anything that might affect society at large. So that's one part. Second part is that the more you understand about your own brain and psychology as well, the, the better you feel, the, the, the more control you feel about your life, the, the better you can build relationships, the more creative you can be. So from a personal perspective, I, I like to invest in that area. And also finally, and more recently, uh, my mother was diagnosed with uh, dementia. I don't know if it's Alzheimer's just yet. So that was another trigger. It's like, okay, wow, I have to go through this, like many, many people in the world. And it's a very painful and difficult disease. So I might as well understand that deeply. So neuroscience also is allowing me to, to make sense of that situation. Oops, sorry. So we have a lot of these uh, elements there. That's why I'm doing it. And I love it. I'm a nerd. I love it. Let me show you this. Maybe in a podcast you won't see it, but this is a brain model. <laughs> and so okay. I have, yeah, this is a brain model that you can okay. disconnect and so on. I have a bunch of stuff. So I love it. I love, I love anything related to how we think and, and why we think the way we do. Yeah. But I think like, so, so we, we've never spoken before, before the, the, this call. So I think one thing that I had read somewhere is how your hustle and your drive is uh, apparent. So I saw that on the internet, like like widely written, and I see that like just that like just the transition, the insane transition from <laughs> from where you started to where you are today is very very impressive, uh, and I see that you're not stopping, which I find both fascinating as a human, but as well as someone that studies entrepreneurship. Uh, I think it the way you guys approach studying customers and the other evolution and never ending. I think that's that's definitely like the right way to go, especially moving in the future where retention is more and more important. Mm -hmm. um, maybe as a last question. So if you were to speak to um, a new person aspiring to be a B2B entrepreneur, what would you suggest they do to find their opportunity? Yeah, so whether you are a bootstrap or a VC company, um, perhaps, oh man, this is, it sounds like a, like a startup <laughs> cliche, but it, it is true, like build intentionally, have intentions. What is the intention that you wanna have with, the, with this company? What is the purpose of this company? And it's not only to make you rich or to solve a problem or perhaps just to, you know, improve society, all these things are really great, but you need more than that. You need to understand, okay, I'm gonna put this out of in the world because I want all these different things to happen. And so I want my team to be financially independent after we sell this company, uh, or, or, or I, want, I don't wanna sell the company, I want this to be a very large company that helps the, the environment and society in these very specific ways. I want to build this because as a person, I want to explore these areas of my life or I want to dedicate my time to really understand this problem as deep as possible. Or I want this to have an impact on my family in whatever way, or I want to be an example example uh, in the ecosystem because I believe in those values or these specific values and I want to build my company as an example of those values like it's being intentionally 360 intentionally uh, intention intentional with the product that you're building the reason why you're building it the market the impact on society the impact in your family the impact on your friends the impact of your team the impact of your dog like whoever is around you you want to make sure that you have a clear vision of what are your intentions. It cannot be just, I wanna build a company and, and I want to make money or I want to scale or I want to be famous. Those are also legitimate reasons. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that they are wrong. They are totally legitimate, but it cannot be the only ones. You really want to see every aspect of yourself as a human being and understand that when you build a company, you are building an extension of yourself. And so, and that thing takes its own life later. And so you want that little monster that you created to be good. So the intentions, that you put, yeah. Yeah, the intentions that you put at the beginning 
are extremely important and they are not separated from you as a person. It's not like I create a company, but then I'm a separate human being here. You are just one human being. So okay. it will affect your life. It will affect your relationships. It will affect how you see yourself. So you might as well spend some time thinking about what are your intentions. Hmm. That's great advice. So thanks for taking the time for the interview. Uh, uh, where can people go to learn more about you and your work, your company? All right. So uh, about me, you can go to sofiaquintero.me. That's a little one page site. Perfect. And there you can find all the links to LinkedIn, to my to Enjoy HQ, to Instagram, whatever, like all the stuff. So you can go there and, and learn more about what I do. You can also email me uh, directly on the website or ping me on Twitter. Yeah, the Twitter is at SofiaQT. But you can find the link on the website. Perfect. We'll link it as well. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much to you. Thank you.